Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Ben Fama, Assistant Director of the MFA in Creative Writing Program here at the New School. We're thrilled to partner with Penn World Voices Festival to bring you tonight's program, which brings together two of today's most inspiring and visionary storytellers, Tara Westover and Min Jin Lee. We are especially happy to host this event during our centennial year. Throughout 2019, all of us at the New School have been thinking deeply about the legacy of higher education, about the role of the artist in intellectual life of our culture, and about how we can intensify and expand our creative and academic work to forge deeper connections to each other. In 1919, a hundred years ago, the New School unveiled a new educational model based on open discussion of ideas and the, that shape civic life. Since then, the New School has opened its doors to asylum seekers and refugee scholars, artists, and others who sought an intellectual home that allowed them to fully articulate their opposition to fascism. Protecting academic freedom and freedom of expression has always been central to who we are and what we do. During our centennial year, we celebrate the expansive range of work that has come out of the New School, and we look forward to what is to come. Now, without further ado, I'll turn the podium over to Min Jin Lee to continue tonight's program. Thank you, Ben. Good evening. My name is Min Jin Lee, and on behalf of the 7,000 writers translators, editors, and other members of the literary community who belong to PEN America, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 15th annual PEN World Voices Festival. <laughs> it's opening night. <laughs> the Cost of an Education with Tara Westover is our event tonight, and we are so excited that we're going to start this, but before we do, I want to tell you about my other job besides being a novelist. This program, I want to let you know, is presented in collaboration with the Schools of Public Engagement at the New School, as you know, and we thank them for their very generous support. I serve as a trustee of the Penn America, and I would like to tell you a little bit about what we do. It is an organization that is deeply important to me. Penn America is an organization that stands at the intersection of literature and human rights to protect open expression at home and abroad. We champion the freedom to write, recognizing the power of the word to transform the world. Our mission is to unite writers and our allies and our readers to celebrate the creative expression and defend the liberties that make it possible. A key part of this mission is to ensure that writers and readers in America continue to be in dialogue with each other and with writers around the world. This festival was founded 15 years ago, and we feature and we celebrate the global community of writers whose works and ideas give our culture substance. With offices in New York City, in Los Angeles, in Washington, D.C., and with members in all 50 states, Penn America is the largest of more, than four, of more than 100 organizations worldwide that make up Penn International's network. We work to ensure that people everywhere have the freedom to write, to convey information and ideas, to express their views, and to access the views, the ideas, and literatures of others. It is an organization much deserving of your support. And you can find ways to do that on our website, pen.org. The lineup for this year's festival is nothing short of extraordinary. Marlon James, Arundhati Roy, Tommy Orange, Rodrigo Ray Rosa, Jennifer Egan, Elif Shafak, Shelly, Sheila Hetty, Elif Bachuman, Danny Shapiro, Sonia Sanchez, Raul Zurita, 
Edward Luis, Kalm Toibin, Mohammed Hanif, Kara Swisher, Morgan Parker, and many, many more. Tickets remain available for some of these events, and you can get them at penworldvoices.org. Finally, I want to thank the sponsors, the supporters, and the volunteers who make the Penn World Voices Festival possible. Thank you all for coming out tonight, and I want to thank Tara for agreeing to take part in what promises to be an extraordinary event. This video will share very briefly some of what we do. Thank you. So tonight, I would love to introduce Tara to you because she's here. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if she wasn't? Okay. <laughs> so Tara was born in Idaho in 1986. She received her BA from Brigham Young University in 2008 and was subsequently awarded a Gates Cambridge scholarship. She earned an MPhil from Trinity College, Cambridge in 2009 and in 2010, she was a visiting fellow at Harvard University. She returned to Cambridge, UK, where she was awarded a PhD in history in 2014. Her first book, Educated, is a number one New York Times bestseller and has remained on the bestseller list for over a year. It was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, as well as for the Penn Jean Stein Book Award. I want you to welcome Tara Westover. Hi. Thanks, everybody, for coming. So, Tara, would you tell us a little bit about your book and about your family background? <laughs> Why, yes. <laughs> um, actually, how many people have read the book? Can I just get a sense? OK, so I'll give a really quick uh, summary, because I don't want to bore those of you who've already read it. But I was um, raised the youngest of seven children on a mountain in Idaho, and my parents were uh, unorthodox, I guess you'd say. They were not typical, and they had a lot of beliefs that most people would find to be a little extreme. So they didn't believe in doctors, they didn't believe in hospitals, and uh, they didn't believe in public education. So I was never put in school. and. Uh, that's just pretty much, uh, that was just my life. I think people hear that and think I must have known how unusual it was, and in some ways I guess I did, because other kids in my town went to school and I knew I didn't, but I very much experienced that as we were living the right way and everyone else was living the wrong way. And um, that's kind of, yeah, that's the basics of what the book is, that's the beginning. That gets you to part of the way. Terrific. So this is really important because I think you call it well, it was called for you when you're growing up the right way versus the wrong way. And where does this idea the right way come from? My dad had a kind of, um, I don't, I hesitate to say fundamentalist because Mormon fundamentalism tends to mean polygamy and we didn't practice polygamy, but he had fundamentalism in the classical term of kind of wanting to return to old ways of doing things. And so he would read 19th century Mormon texts and he would feel like God was telling him different things, was giving him revelations. One of them was that you weren't supposed to go to school, that that was the wrong thing to do, and that doctors were part of this conspiracy by the Illuminati. It was a funny mix of kind of religious radicalism and then some very right-wing New World Order Illuminati stuff would get mixed in there. And I mean, uh, he was very preoccupied with the end of the world, so he thought that the end times 
were coming in again. That's the kind of thing that people think that must have been really terrifying to grow up wearing about the end of the world. And I think for some people who've grown up in those situations, it has been. I spent a lot of my childhood canning food because my dad wanted to have a 10-year supply of food, which is kind of a lot of food, <laughs> actually. <laughs> It was a lot of food. And so I spent a lot of my childhood counting food. And I, yeah, people say to me, oh, that must have been really terrifying. We're in constantly about the apocalypse. And in some ways, yes, but in a lot of ways, no. I mean, I thought we were going to have all this food. It was you people I thought should be worried. You know, I thought we're going we're gonna to be fine. We got, we've got all this. We have provisions. We've got everything we need. And everybody else is going to be in real trouble. And were there people in your community in Idaho who supported your dad? I think that's an interesting question. I think there were a lot of, he was very well loved. He was very charismatic. I think people just thought, oh, you know, that's just him. He has these kind of funny ideas. Um, so there weren't really maybe one other family who thought similarly to my dad and pulled their kids out of school and lived the way we did. But no, n there weren't very many that lived like us, really, just the one family. So this book has been compared widely with hillbilly elegies as well as um, Glass Walls by, uh, Jean I'm sorry, Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls. And I thought that was kind of an unfair comparison in many ways because it's, to me it really reminded me of Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy, where I know, <laughs> but hers has a much happier ending. And also uh, Behind the Beautiful Forevers by Catherine Boo which features two characters. Have you read um, Boo's book? I haven't, It's no. really amazing. It's about India. It's, uh, it's called Behind the Beautiful Forevers, Life, Death, and Hope in Mumbai, Under City by Catherine Boo. It was a Pulitzer Prize winner, and it's a nonfiction book, and it features children who grew up in junkyards. And unlike Jude, and unlike Sunil and Abdul, you actually get to get your education. So can you talk about the transit of being without having a GED, which you, I believe you still do not have. No, I don't. Right. I don't have one. Or right. a diploma. So that's Right. But the nice thing I learned is that once you have a PhD, people stop asking for your transcripts in high right. school, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> which is really great. So can you talk about how you went from having zero education, zero public um, education, and any classroom experience to going to university? Um, yeah, it was... A it was a bumpy transition. It started when I was 16. I was working in my dad's junkyard. I didn't really want to be doing that. My dad's junkyard, uh, he was a well-meaning individual, but for all kinds of reasons that we may or may not go into, people tended to get hurt in my dad's junkyard. It wasn't super OSHA <laughs> approved. And um, I just didn't want to work in it anymore. And I had a very problematic relationship with an older brother of mine. I, I would never have said that I needed to escape from that relationship, but I think I felt it, whether I would have said it or not. And another brother of mine, who I hadn't seen or really interacted with very much in years, just turned up one day and said, you should try to go to college. And this was a brother, he himself had gone to college. My dad got a little more extreme as he got older. And so some of my older brothers had actually attended some school. My brother Tyler was one of those. So he had attended some high school before he was pulled out. And so he um, just got that bug for education, taught himself trigonometry. Uh, many years later, after he had a PhD in mechanical engineering, he would tell me that nothing in his life that he'd ever done was harder than teaching himself trigonometry. That was by far the hardest thing. And so he had carved out this path where he taught himself trig, he taught himself algebra, he taught himself calculus. And then he went to college, and he drops back into my life. He's about nine years older than me when I was 16, and says, just, just do what I did. It's, you know, hard, but you'll be fine. And um, I, I decided to try it. I was nowhere near as successful as he was at the self-teaching thing. But I did well enough on the college test after a year of teaching myself algebra to kind of scrape through into this university. And I put on the application that I'd been homeschooled to a rigorous standard, which was not true. But um, universities, it turns out, will believe things if you put them. <laughs> the joke was a little funnier till a couple months ago. Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> not so good now. Um, so I ended up in college. Uh, the only trouble was I didn't know anything. 
and I'd never been in a classroom, and I'd never written an essay, and um, one of my first classes, I raised my hand and asked what the Holocaust was, because I just hadn't heard of it. I, I knew, it's, it's, a strange, it's a weird thing to try to explain to people. I had heard stories, I remember my mother telling me, of, of Jews being killed in some context. I knew, I was familiar with this idea that they had been killed, but in my mind, it was the same as the Boston Massacre. I thought it was like, oh yeah, there was some kind of skirmish and five or six people were killed and it was in that kind of category for me. And, then, and I didn't know what the name of it was. And then I got to college and there's this word and I'd never heard it and I asked what it was. And obviously the rest of the class, it doesn't occur to them that I could be sincerely asking. So they heard it, I think as a denial, like what is this? And I meant it sincerely. What is this? And um, then I had to leave the classroom and go Google this site. I was just starting to learn how to use the internet and working out and learn about this thing and kind of come to terms with two things at the same time. One, that something really awful like that could happen, which I hadn't known the day before. And then just that it could happen and I couldn't know about it. You know, something like that could happen and I, I could just somehow miss it. Everyone else, it would exist in everybody else's head, but not in my head. And there were a lot of other things like that, like the civil rights movement was like that for me. I just never, just never heard of it. I was just curious about the structural impediments which prevented you from getting an education. And some of it was that, that your parents, well, really what your father didn't believe in public school, but then your mother felt that she would go along with what your father said. Is that correct? I think and that's always really complicated. It was definitely came from my dad, mm -hmm. the idea that schools were evil. I think my mother initially believed that she could give us a better education at home, so she was happy to go along with it because she thought, well, I can teach them. But I just think as time went on, she had seven children, she had an herbalist business, she was a midwife, she was canning 10 years of food. Uh, there start to be limits right. to what you can do. And so I think the older boys had, when I talk to my older brothers, they say, oh no, we had some structure, we had these kind of things. But um, Richard and I, for example, don't ever remember, like, never wrote an essay, never took an exam, never. There were some books in the house, but when I came to try to learn algebra, for example, there wasn't, I had to go buy it. So I think, I think it's a little more complicated. I think my mother just thought she could make up the difference and then it just didn't turn out to be the case. And there was one point in the book that you described that you come back from school and you don't think you're gonna go back. And I think that your mother actually says, oh no, I really thought you were the, one of my children who would go to school, isn't that correct? Yeah. she. I've always said that my mother, I feel like my mother is actually two people. And there's, at least in my head, she's two people. And I think of her, there's my mother on the one hand, and then there's my father's wife. And to me, they're, they're just not the same person. And who my mother is when you are with her and my dad's not there is a very different person than who she is when, when my dad is there. I felt that you wrote about both your parents with a great deal of love. And sensitivity. I was, I was trying to, which is awkward because I'm estranged from them and sure. I choose not to have them in my life. And so I get all kinds of feedback from people about that decision. Uh, I get a lot of people saying, oh, I have Stockholm Syndrome and I shouldn't write it from that perspective. And I feel like, well, why? If Stockholm Syndrome is a thing, you might as well write about it. I, <laughs> I felt like... Um, I wanted a story that would be recognizable to people who are struggling with the kind of feelings that I was struggling with. And some people become estranged from their parents and they're just maybe thrilled about it, I don't know, and they just can't wait to be rid of them. But that was not how I felt. I really loved my parents. I found the loss of my family to be really devastating. Um, whether I should have missed them or not didn't really matter, I did miss them. So I wanted to write the story about all the reasons that those relationships are really compelling and that there can be really good... I, I, I personally don't think that abusive relationships 99% of the time are with people who are wholly bad. I think they always have these wonderfully redeeming qualities to them. And in fact, I remember once when I was 16, I saw a movie at my grandmother's house and it was of this just representation of this very physically violent, abusive relationship. And I remember asking myself the question in these exact words, I remember saying, I wonder if my relationship with Sean is abusive. 
I remember asking myself that. And I decided it wasn't because most of the time my brother was great. He was really great, really sensitive, really lovely. The only person who was really aware of me, I felt like, and listened to me. And I guess in writing the book, I thought there's no point denying what's really positive and powerful about these relationships. And it's no point writing about it and denying that there's a real loss there. There's no point writing it and acting like it's all a good thing like, and that there's no reason why they had that kind of draw. I think if you hadn't written them with true love, then the loss would actually be meaningless. So I think you had to write it that way. Otherwise, we wouldn't care that you're estranged from them. Maybe, yeah. Right? So what I'm curious about is um, this father that you describe, and, he, and when we think about memoirs, memoirs are a memory fixed in time. So who he is today is not the same person who he was 10 years ago or 20 years ago, right? So when you're describing this person, this character is evolving through time, and also he may not be this way today. We don't know, because he's not here to defend himself either. What I was curious about is that at one point in your work, you talk about the strain of mental illness when he actually switches. Because who he was as a father when he was a younger man might have been different than who he is today. And apparently, he disputes this claim. So can you speak about that? Um, the, the mental illness claim, my parents don't think that my dad is paranoid. They, they just, or that he has bipolar. And I say in the book, I'm not a medical professional. I have absolutely no clinical proof of it. I mean, my view is that the irony of him being paranoid and having this insane fear of doctors is that he'll never get diagnosed. Um, so I don't know, but I could be wrong. I just know when I discovered bipolar disorder at university and I read about it and I heard a lecture about it, it was the first time that I felt like my life made sense to me. It was the first time I felt like oh, that's what it was. Like Everything that I hadn't been able to figure out about my life suddenly made sense. So I could be wrong. I'm not a professional, but that's the way. It's the only way that I can kind of put it together and reconcile the fact that I know my dad loved me, I knew he cared about me, I knew he cared about my safety, and yet he made insane decisions about safety in my family that almost guaranteed people were going to get really hurt. And... Um, I, I just feel like he really cared about us, but his his beliefs had to be... I find his beliefs to be not rational, and I believe that he must have sincerely had them because I think he cared about us, otherwise he wouldn't have made the choices he made. And the only way I can really square that circle is just to say, um, okay, it was paranoia and it was caused by something else, that that's where these ideas came from. But I, I could be wrong. No, I don't think you're wrong, actually. <laughs> but I just wanted you to talk about it, because I think it's worth sharing. I think it's really worth considering. And also, can you talk a little bit about Sean, this charismatic person? Because he is so central in the way the narrative of this memoir pivots, right? So he's, and because the other person that you were talking about earlier is Tyler, who is the, the brother who cared deeply about music, who gave you a love of music, and he shared his boombox with you right, and gave you great solace. And I think one of the things that's interesting about this book is that we look at all these claims that are really difficult and hard to understand and certainly unconventional. And yet, you have a young narrator who is completely aware of the beauty of her life. There is great beauty in this work. And I was just curious, Tyler was somebody who gave you beauty and recognized your love of music, and your father recognized your love of music, and he was very proud of you. Now, can you speak about Sean and why that was a pivot? Um, that's an interesting observation about being aware of beauty. I think I was. I was told a lot how beautiful the mountain was, and I agreed that it was. And I was told that the scriptures that we were reading were beautiful, and I agreed that they were. Uh, so I think I was. I was really aware of that. Um, the other side of that is a strange thing to say. I don't think I was as aware of it. Things would happen, very dramatic things, very frightening things sometimes. And I think I would just kind of edit them out of my life experience really soon after they happened. Or my brother had a pretty incredible ability to... Which brother? Sean. Okay. Had this ability to... Um, 
he could kind of rewrite it almost immediately. So, so uh, there was a really dramatic incident where um, he grabbed me by my hair and he dragged me down the hallway and he shoved my head in the toilet and he did this in front of a friend of mine. I was 17 at the time. And it was... In, you, this, this is a boy who's interested in you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was a really dramatic, just awful experience. But after it was over, he said to me, my brother said to me, well, you know, we were just having a good, we were just wrestling, we were just having fun, and you were laughing, and you were having a good time. And I thought, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure I was. And I think it was, I think it's so much easier to just accept that explanation. For me, it was, it was so much more comfortable to say, oh, there was a misunderstanding, and if I'd spoken more clearly, then everything would have been fine, and I'm sure we were having fun, it got a little out of hand. It's a more pleasant narrative, so I think you're just drawn to it anyway, and I had this older brother who I loved and respected telling me that's what happened, and I wanted to believe it, and so I did, and then I would just end up feeling kind of confused, because there was obviously a part of me that was fearful or upset, or maybe even uh, hated my brother a little bit, and I didn't Maybe I didn't express overtly, but I, I clearly was living with that, and I, I think I just didn't know which was which was which was real. I had no idea. But there are moments as you become older and you become more coming of age. There's a coming of age moment when you're terrified of this person, and that the dog incident, when Diego is murdered. I mean, he sla this Diego's a dog, and Sean slashes his throat. Killed him with a knife somehow. I wasn't there, but I imagine it was either that or through the heart, but I wasn't there. Right. And it's really that incident, as well as Audrey, the sister character, who asks you for support. And it's really that which becomes difficult for you. Um, I think people tend to get really focused on Sean, which I understand why they do, because he is, I feel like the aliens are about to land. <laughs> um, because he's so dramatic and he does dramatic things like kill pets. But, um, sorry, I shouldn't make jokes, it's really serious. Um, he does these dramatic things, but I, I guess for me, the. The, the painful bit or the difficult bit is always my parents. It's always going to be my parents because um, I don't know what's going on with my brother and I don't know why he is the way he is and I don't know why he behaves the way he behaves. <clears throat> but I do know that um, when I told my parents about it, uh, maybe they thought I was crazy. Maybe they thought that I was uh, deluded. But I feel like there was a way to respond to that or probably many ways to respond to that. And the way that they did respond to it was to say that I was lying, that I was making it up, and eventually to tell people I was possessed. That was the way that they dealt with it. And um, for me, that's always been the problem, uh, I, I think. Is I would have a problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, I mean, I, I would say almost even more than anything that happened with my brother, um, which... It's the not being believed? It's not, it's not necessarily that, because I think... Uh, I would, let me put it another way. I, I really truly believe that if I'd gone to my parents and, uh, and, and said to them, what, instead of what I did say, which is, Sean has a problem, we know Sean has a problem. I think if I'd gone to them and said, Tyler has a problem, I think they would have been so kind. Because I think they would have thought that was crazy. And I think they would have thought I was losing it and they would have wanted to be helpful and supportive. And because um, Tyler's lovely and no one would ever believe that of him because they just wouldn't. And I think it was actually because my brother Sean had had ongoing problems with a number of people and it, it was a vulnerability that they perceived in, them, in themselves and they, they imagined that having to change the family or to confront this very difficult thing would be to break the family apart. And so it's not necessarily that they didn't believe me but that... Um, that impulse against any kind of change or confrontation or even just listening. I don't know as though I needed them to believe me, but I think, yeah, telling people I was possessed was maybe a bit of a, was too far, I guess. And it's, it's not just the questioning of it, because I think questioning can be kind of natural. Is this, I don't know, is this make sense? Is a reasonable thing? But um, that impulse to shut down debate and to say, well, you don't, 
that you're not entitled to have your experience is a really difficult thing to move past in a family. And so I've always said, um, I actually do feel like with my family, the cover-up was worse than the crime. And I do think that there's a way forward from abusive relationships. I do think that my brother could get help or that we could find ways to navigate that. I really do, but I don't think that's possible if, if the response is, is the way that it was. Absolutely. So I was just wondering if you can talk a little bit about how your mother's position was in this in your work, if you could read that and share that with us. Yeah, so there's a, a, well, it's a very serious evening. I don't usually talk so much about sad things, so um, this isn't going to be any lighter. Um, there, I thought the section was so beautiful. Well, thank you, uh, but it's, it's, it's not light reading. Um, there was a moment where I told my, I told my, my sister and I ended up talking about my brother. And it turned out that we'd kind of had similar experiences, or it seemed like we had. And then my sister wanted to confront my parents, and I really, really did not want to do that. And uh, she ended up telling my mom what I'd said. Um, and I didn't know that she had, but I was in England, and my mother was in Idaho, and she found me online, essentially, after, after talking to my sister. So I'm just going to read that bit, and then sorry for the heaviness of this event. You can all go have a drink after, and it's going to be okay. For all of that day, Mother pondered it. Then she decided she had to hear the words from me. It was late afternoon in Idaho, nearly midnight in England, when my mother, unsure how to place an international call, found me online. The words on the screen were small, confined to a tiny text box in the corner of the browser but somehow they seemed to swallow the room. She told me she'd read my letter. I braced myself for rage. It's painful to read reality, she wrote, to realize there was something ugly, and I refused to see it. I had to read those lines a number of times before I understood them, before I realized that she was not angry, not blaming me, or trying to convince me I'd only imagined. She believed me. Don't blame yourself, I told her. Your mind was never the same after the accident. Maybe, she said, but sometimes I think we choose our illnesses because they benefit us in some way. I asked mother why she'd never stopped Sean from hurting me. Sean always said you picked the fights, and I guess I wanted to believe that because it was easier, because you were strong and rational and anyone could see that Sean was not. That didn't make it that didn't make sense. If I had seemed rational, why had mother believed Sean when he told her I was picking fights, that I needed to be subdued, disciplined? I'm a mother, she said. Mothers protect. And Sean was so damaged. I wanted to say that she was also my mother, but I didn't. I don't think dad will believe any of this, I typed. He will, she wrote, but it's hard for him. It reminds him of the damage his bipolar has caused our family. I had never heard mother admit that dad might be mentally ill. Years before, I'd told her what I'd learned in my psychology class about bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, but she'd shrugged it off. Hearing her say it now felt liberating. The illness gave me something to attack besides my father. So when mother asked why I hadn't come to her sooner, why I'd never asked for help, I answered honestly. Because you were so bullied by dad, I said. You were not powerful in the house. Dad ran things, and he was not going to help us. I'm stronger now, she said. I no longer run scared. When I read this, I imagined my mother as a young woman, brilliant and energetic, but also anxious and complying. Then the image changed, her body thinning, elongating, her hair flowing long and silver. Emily is being bullied, I wrote. She is, mother said, like I was. She is you, I said. She is me, but we know better now. We can rewrite the story. I asked about a memory. It was from the weeks before I left for BYU, after Sean had had a particularly bad night. He'd brought mother to tears, then plopped onto the sofa and turned on the TV. 
I'd found her sobbing at the kitchen table, and she'd asked me not to go to BYU. You're the only one strong enough to handle him, she'd said. I can't, and your father can't. It has to be you. I typed reluctantly. Do you remember telling me not to go to school, that I was the only one who could handle Sean? Yes, I remember that. There was a pause, then more words appeared, words I hadn't known I needed to hear. But once I saw them, I realized I'd been searching my whole life for them. You were my child. I should have protected you. I lived a lifetime in the moment I read those lines, a life that was not the one I had actually lived. I became a different person who remembered a different childhood. I didn't understand the magic of those words then, and I don't understand it now. I know only this, that when my mother told me she had not been the mother to me that she wished she'd been, she became that mother for the first time. I love you, I wrote, and closed my laptop. That section is really quite so powerful because you have the narrator having this moment of recognition and a moment of confirmation of her opinion. And also you have this mother who really does want to have a connection with the narrator. And I was wondering what you really thought about how, like, was that enough or did that moment pass? I guess it passed because when my dad got involved, he said I was lying, and then my mother said I was lying. And so it was, um, it quite literally passed. But I think I have a view, I have a theory, and I'm not a psychologist, so you probably shouldn't listen to me, but um, I have this theory that all kinds of difficult, abusive, toxic relationships, whatever kind they are, I feel like they all have the same effect, which is that they collapse a person's sense of self. And I hadn't thought about this when I wrote that passage. Funny enough, I've thought about it a lot since. And what I feel like that passage is about really is that not just that my brother was doing these difficult things, but that I believed, rightly or wrongly, that everybody knew and that they were OK with it. And then the message to me was, well, that's okay, because it's fine that it's happening to you, because you don't matter. And for me, there was something incredibly powerful in having my mother say, it shouldn't have been like that. That's not what it should have been like. And that's what I meant when I said I lived a different life. It was almost like, by her saying I, I, I messed up, it allowed me to imagine that, I, that, that she'd put a stop to it, even though she hadn't. And that's what I meant when I said I really do think the cover-up was worse than the crime because I do think people can heal. And I do think families can move forward from these kind of things. I really believe it. But I think that the thing that is wrong has to be addressed. And, um, you know, in my family, we weren't, we just weren't able to do that. I think my mother I think most families can't to, do it. I think it's incredibly hard. Um, mm -hmm. I think my mother really wanted to, but... My mother, I've seen do amazing things. She started a business that she grew. She invented the products herself. She built it up. It's now impressive. She's resourceful. She taught herself all kinds of things. She's a midwife. The one thing I've never seen her do is stand up to my dad. I've just never seen it. And that would prove really definitive in this case. Can we talk about the role of education? Because we have all the trauma, right? But we also have all this resilience and resourcefulness and inventiveness and just boldness. We have three members of the seven children who get PhDs. We're Tara's not the only party. one. We're fun people at a dinner party. Yeah. <laughs> and can you, so you have essentially seven children who are pretty much taken out of public school systems. They were not encouraged in any way, really to seek formal education. If anything, we're told that formal education could corrupt your soul. It would actually cause damnation. It's nothing like it's bad for you. It's kind of like, no, there's hell. Reverse psychology in action. Right. <laughs> and how to get your kids to study for their SATs. Um, you don't want to do it. <laughs> and I was- You I was, tell them they can't. <laughs> so it first started out with Tyler, and then it was you, and then it was Richard. Is that correct? Is that the order? 
Yeah, Richard is older than me, funny enough, but uh, Tyler went first, and then he kind of kicked me and said, you should do this. And then together, Tyler and I worked Richard over pretty hard. So he went, I think, when he was 21 or 22. And also, Richard was considered to be the genius in the family, according to the father. Yeah, uh, and he is. If, if you met Tyler and Richard, I mean, they're both extraordinary. Um, I'm not a modest person, and I'm very comfortable saying I'm not as smart as them. I'm not even... <laughs> It's not even close. They're just kind of freaks in the best way, both of them. And, um, you know, Richard would just read the dictionary as a kid. Uh, he'd just sit under the couch because he didn't want to get caught and put to work. And he'd just read the dictionary, just page one. And, um, and Tyler would take everything apart and teach himself these incredible things. So I think part of it is that they're extraordinary individuals. I don't, I don't fully get it, except I think um, probably there was something in the deprivation of it where... Once we got to school, we were that much more committed to it. But I, I certainly wouldn't say from that, well, what we really need to do to fix our education system is just stop teaching people and like <laughs> withhold and see if it makes them really want it more. I wouldn't quite go that far. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> so nature nurture, what do you think? I don't think much about it, because I think it's a sample size of one family, mm -hmm. and um, there are many things you could say about my family, but typical is not a word I would use. And I mean that um, my brothers, my dad is freakishly smart. I think my mother is freakishly smart. I think my brothers obviously inherited that, both of them. Um, so I, I would, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess, is, is, is the answer. I think it has to be both. I think my parents did instill some very useful things in us as kids. I mean, they taught us, they taught us hard work. They taught us self-sufficiency. They taught us that our education was our responsibility. Um, and then I think that with Tyler and Richard, they're both just sort of genius. They're just kind of geniusy a little bit. They've got a little genius in them. And um, Tyler, I think it's hard for me to imagine that you could have put him anywhere that he wouldn't have eventually fought his way to university. It's just hard for me. Richard, I think, is equally smart, but socially was more dissuadable. I think he, he, needed, he needed Tyler and I to kind of yank him out a little bit. So I was wondering about, as a writer, when you think about the memoir, you play a lot with memory in this work. And you are quite forthcoming when you say memory is unreliable. And I was wondering how you dealt with that when you were writing this work. Well, I was writing a book about the fact that I thought my brother was violent and my parents were saying, no, no, he's not at all. And I thought, that's a central part of the book. So I can't really, I can't really get around it. I can't be too cute with it. Like that is part of what the thing is about is saying I think this and they don't think that and um and also the whole incident with Luke when your brother set on fire. Yeah, there were many I would say every incident that ever happened in my family there's a way to read it where my dad is possibly mentally ill, deeply paranoid or there's a way to read it where he's just oh, you know, he's just a little he's got some funny ideas. And um that's the way I would say I read it most of my life, I guess. Uh, I either thought he was like a prophet, or I thought, oh, he's a little extreme in some of his ideas, but pretty much normal. And then it, it, it took me a long time to change my own view. So I guess I would say I was saying those things about a collapsed sense of self. I don't think that the antidote to that is to say, well, now my version is the only version that matters, because I, mine was repressed, and so now, the, now I have all the power, and we're going to say my version is the only version. I, I feel like... There's no, um, if you want to be respected for having your own views, you have to respect other people's views. And if you want to be respected for having your own memories, you have to respect other people's memories. That's the wellspring that you draw from when you ask people to listen to you, is that you listen to them. And so I wanted to write, I, I, I felt like if it was going to be useful for people who experienced what I was experiencing, which is people having, growing up in families where uh, reality is moving every which way and you don't really know what's happening, I had to acknowledge look, I've done my best to figure this out, but these are the different ways that these events are being refracted. This is how it's going, and this is the, the, the version that's coming out of these different wings of the family. And, uh, you know, good luck to you sorting it out. I haven't had any luck sorting it out. I'll just tell you, like, this is what I was able to achieve. And 
I, I just felt like there, was, there wasn't really any point in saying, well, my family, we have the same view of everything, because we clearly, we clearly don't. And it looked like the dividing line between how things are remembered were really based upon the level of education. Yeah, I think that's, that's, probably, that's probably true. I think, I mean, even, even still, my, my experience with my parents is very different even though than Tyler and Richard's, I would say. Um, and they've been supportive and they were great, especially with the stuff with Sean, but it's, it's different for them. You know, being raised as a, as, a, as a male in my dad's household is really different from being raised as a female, for example. Or families have generations. Yes. So I think... Uh, and also you were the youngest. I was the youngest. I think right. Tyler's experience of my parents' homeschool is really different from Richard and I, who had a very different experience with it. And so that's kind of what I mean by not... Just not, not becoming um, fascistic about it and saying, well, my, this is the one history. Uh, I think there can be many histories. There have to be room for more points of view. And I had to just kind of trust people to say, I don't actually... You don't have to believe my version. You can believe the other version. I guess what I would hope for people is that they believe I'm doing the best I can to tell it the way that I think it was. And um, I'm open to being wrong about it. Now, normally, I'm not very pleased when people who are so young write memoirs. We can fight about that later. Right. However, however, I did think that this memoir is so important, and it's so beautifully written, and has enormous insight. And I'm so glad you wrote it. And I was wondering if you can tell us why Professor Runciman encouraged you to write the memoir. It's interesting. I don't know. You'd have to ask him. <laughs> I don't know why he did. Because um, I don't think he knew much of the story in a lot of ways. I think he knew bits and pieces of it. And I don't think neither one of us would have imagined this, uh, none, uh, the book itself, let alone anything that happened with the publication of it. So. Uh, I, I really don't know. I mean, he, he's, he's always believed in storytelling, I guess. And um, I, I can't tell you why he did. I can tell you why I wanted to write it, I guess, which and why I would, I would dispute a little bit. I don't think there's any age that you should write a memoir, I think. I, any more than I think there's an age that you should write a novel. Because I think any age that you write a memory or a story, is, it's going to change that story. So you could write the story of the first time you fell in love. And you could write it when you're 18, or you could write it when you're 70. And it's going to be a really different story. Same events, but you're refracting it th through a different perspective. And I don't want all of my novels written by 70-year-old men, and I don't want all of my memoirs written by 20-year-old women. I don't think there's a particular age. So I, I, didn't, I didn't say that. Huh? I, just, I just said that I'm normally... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not saying yeah. that you would say that. I just mean I, 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 I would want the same kind of diversity in memoirs that I would want in, in novels, actually. And I think there is an idea that you should be... Um, that you should write a memoir at the end of your life. And I, I guess I think it probably depends on the topic. And this topic, I was writing about estrangement. And it's something that's very hard to talk about estrangement. It's, it's, I think a lot of people struggle with it and it's difficult to acknowledge. I even, I've been doing this for a year and I still, a minute ago when I was like laughing about very serious things, it's because I get uncomfortable and then I laugh because I'm uncomfortable and it just makes you seem crazy. Um, but it's, it's a difficult thing to talk about. I didn't feel like it was being talked about enough so I wanted to talk about it. But I actually felt like aside from those points, there is an age for it for me in this, because estrangement, one of the things that is really hard about estrangement is not knowing the future. Right. And not knowing how the story ends. And if you wrote it, you could write about an estrangement that happened when you were 30, when you were 70, and I just think it, it, you couldn't really write about estrangement because it would, what's so hard about it is, is just not knowing how it will play out. And estrangement isn't something that happens, it's a decision that you have to make. Every day, well, this is what we're going to do every day. We're going to keep doing this because it's working, uh, because it's better than not. And I just didn't feel like I could capture that kind of urgency if I wrote it when I was older. In some ways, I would give everything to know what my older self thinks of the decisions I've made now. And, and that's what made it hard, is I don't have access to that. So you felt motivated to write the memoir because you wanted to discuss estrangement. I think it was how it started for me. 
Yeah, I think maybe the initial seed was I wanted to write about education because I knew I'd had this strange path to education and I wanted to tell a story about education that wasn't just about getting a career or making a lot of money, but it was about all the ways it can change your life. And I thought, kind of bizarrely, <laughs> that I could write this whole story about my education and never talk about my family. Uh, which I don't really know how I thought that would work, but I really believed it and then started writing it and realized really soon that was impossible. The story of my family and the story of my education were the exact same story. But once I really started writing and had any um, conviction, yeah, I think the estrangement was a big part of it because I felt like that was how the education... It really was going out and getting exposed to different points of view and learning about different ways of thinking, different perspectives to see the world, I think, that gave me any kind of comfort to have my own perspective on my family. Not to say it's the only perspective or the absolute perspective, but it is, um, it's my perspective and I'm entitled to it. And I think actually maybe even it was studying history and learning. There are different points of view on things. and they deserve to be listened to. You know, there's not one history of the civil rights movement. There's not one way to look at it. And uh, I, I found that they were just really connected, that muscle that you have that allows you to say, I think this and you think something else, and that's okay, uh, helped me develop my own way of thinking about my, my family. One of your professors talks about Pygmalion, and that's something that sort of shows up in your work. And the last two sentences, no, the three sentences of your work, which is, there's no spoiler here, is essentially, I think, your thesis statement. And you say, you could call this selfhood many things. Transformation, metamorphosis, falsity, betrayal. I call it an education. So is education, transformation, metamorphosis, falsity, or betrayal? Maybe it's all of those things. Um... You know, I had a, it's funny, I had a friend say to me that it was really clever that I wrote it that way because I was calling, I was saying these harsh things like falsity, betrayal, and then other people couldn't really say it because I already said it. Um, I thought it was actually really smart the way you said it. I think it's a really strong thesis statement because education does require mortification of a prior self. And that's a very dangerous idea. It's not, it's not something that we'd usually tell children, by the way, if you learn something, you're going to know something that maybe you didn't know before, and that could separate us. Yeah, and I guess I would say education is um, change, and change, real change, always has some kind of cost. I mentioned that I'd never heard about the civil rights movement, and I hadn't, and I got to college, and There's a very I... horrible section in here about when you're called the N-word, repeatedly by Sean, and you have to decide what you're going to do with that, because Two members of your family believe that this is an okay thing. Well, my whole family, I think, at that point, or like maybe I mean, from not what Tyler, I read, I but know. most people, yeah. I, I would say I wasn't called it one summer. I was called it many summers, and it never bothered me. I must have known a little bit what it was, but I can't really reconstruct what was going through my mind before. But I know I went to college, never heard of the civil rights movement, and I went to this history class, and the teacher puts up a picture of Rosa Parks and says, we're going to talk about the civil rights movement, and here's this woman. She was arrested for taking a seat on a bus. And I understood him as saying that she had been arrested for stealing the seat. Because it was the only thing, it made perfect, it was an unfortunate misunderstanding of take a seat versus to take the seat. <laughs> and um, I... If you have no context for the civil rights movement, I think that makes perfect sense to think, oh, right, of course, because stealing is a crime, <laughs> and sitting isn't, really. Uh, so it just wouldn't have occurred to me that that, that could have happened. And um, OK, eventually I figured it out, and I learned what was being talked about, and that was really shocking to me. And then we went through, we went through the history. And then I went home, and then I was working in the junkyard, as I had many other times in my life, and my face gets covered in grease because I was brushing my hair out of my face and it was my hands were covered in grease my face gets dark and my brother starts calling me this word which he'd called me many times in my life and I'd never thought a, about it. This is Sean again. This is Sean again. Yeah. I'd never thought about it and I hadn't even thought about it when we were in the classroom learning about it. I hadn't thought about it until I was back in that situation and suddenly things were different and I saw my family differently, I saw myself differently, I saw the role that we were playing in this history differently, and I couldn't unsee that. 
uh, there was no way for me to go back in time and suddenly be okay with it again and feel comfortable with that part of my family culture, not with what I knew. That was that had been done, and there was no undoing it. Yeah. Um, can I ask you a question for all the writers in the room who are working on memoirs? Do you sure. have any advice for memoir writers? Um, I always say, and I could be wrong because <laughs> I might not know anything, but I think my view is that when memoirs go badly, it's one of two things. One is it's written by people who have an interesting story to tell, but they're not writers and they don't pay enough attention to the writing. So they think that the story is enough. And it might be. It might be enough to get it published. But if the story is worth telling, it's worth telling well. And you'll do yourself a great service if you do what it takes to learn how to write as well as you can. Maybe that's, maybe that's really well, maybe it's less well, but it's worth doing it the best that you can. And so I'd say putting attention into the actual writing and not just the story. And that's one bit. The second thing I think, the second reason I think memoirs often go wrong is, um, and this happens with really seasoned writers, I think, too, so it's kind of the opposite of the other problem, is just narcissism. Uh, you forget that what's fascinating to you because it's your life is actually not interesting to anyone else and you have to, someone said this to me, a writer said this to me in a writer's group I was in. Um, I asked him what he thought was the weakness in my work and he said, one, really big one, you're not, you're not earning my interest. You just think that your family's interesting and that I'll be interested and you're not, you're not earning it. Uh, and he was completely right. <laughs> I wasn't, I just, uh, they were interesting to me, and I just assumed that they would be interesting to other people. And I wasn't building the story carefully enough to, to put reasons in why people would want to read it. And I think it's the hardest thing to, f to remember that I'm very interested in my life because it happened to me, and I'm the center of my life. Um, but that, I think, is the hardest thing for memoir, is, is trying to think, if this, were, if this were fiction, if this were a story, if this were someone else's story, why would I keep reading? Because it, ultimately it's going to be other people that are going to want to, that you want to have reading it and they're going to feel differently about it than, than you will. It's like telling people a dream. You think your dreams are super interesting because um, <laughs> the feelings are really intense with your dreams and other people are cut off from that and so you have to build that for them. In your author's note, you say, this story is not about Mormonism. Neither is it about any other form of religious belief. In it, there are many types of people, some believers, some not, some kind, some not. The author disputes any correlation, positive or negative, between the two. That is true. This book is not about Mormonism. However, every person in this work is deeply informed by faith. Can you speak? And also, you wrote a dissertation about how Mormonism is an intellectual idea. And to get your doctorate. So could you share with us a little bit about how Mormonism is not in the book, but it affects these individuals, and also how it is an important American intellectual historical idea? Um, I wanted the first sentence to be, it's not a book about Mormonism for a couple of reasons. One is my family are not representative of Mormonism. Like everybody in my town is Mormon, and they went to school, and they went to the doctor, and my family had this very radical version of Mormonism that I felt like just, I didn't want anyone to read the book and say, Right, those are Mormons. It's like maybe in the 19th century, but they're not Mormons now. The other part of it, I thought, is just um, the arc of that story: girl raised by survivalists, religious radicals, and she gets out. I think we have such a tendency to see people through ideology, or to see people through cliches, or to see stories through cliches, and to dismiss them and say, "Well, I know what that is." So I don't need to uh, engage with that. We think if someone owns a rifle that we know everything that we need to know about them because rifle ownership comes with like 40 other things and we just dismiss it. And I just think people are not actually cliches even when they have the 10 attributes that you associate with that cliche. They're complicated, fully realized people who put their kids to bed and worry about them and just are normal. And um, my dad is not any exception. I think of him as a radical. I think of him as an extreme person. But he is not emotionally any less complete than any other person I've 
met. And so I, th I just wanted to try to challenge that tendency we have to say, well, that's religious extremism, and so I know what that is, and I don't have to engage with it. I think Mormonism is a character in the story. It's there. It plays a part. But I don't think it plays the, the biggest part, even. And it certainly doesn't define everything. There were people in that story. One of the people who made the biggest difference to my life was a Mormon bishop who had a lot of views that I imagine, given that we're in New York City, a lot of people here would find um, abhorrent, actually. He thought women should get married young. He thought they should be stay-at-home moms. Um, and this was a bishop who, when I was going to drop out of school because I had a terrible toothache and I couldn't pay to get it fixed, tried to get me to take money from the church, spend a good, I don't know, six, seven hours trying to convince me to take this money. I wouldn't take it. Then he tried to convince me to pay, pay, apply for a Pell Grant. I wouldn't do that either. And then he pulled a check uh, out of his drawer, his own personal checkbook, and wrote me a check for $1,400. And... Um, I could sit here and say, well, I'm a better person than him because I have more enlightened views about women. But I've never done that. I've never offered somebody that kind of money out of my own account. And so I guess I just think it's people are incredibly complicated and maybe you disagree with someone on one thing, but that doesn't mean they're not capable of astonishing compassion in, in other really meaningful ways. So... That, I guess, is what I meant by this is not a story about Mormonism. That's wonderful. Thank you. So I know you have questions for Tara. And Victor, our producer, has told us that this is time. The only thing that's really important. Really subtly. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm so grateful. Thank you, Victor. And thank you, Joe, up there. Without the invisible labor of so many volunteers and workers, we wouldn't have this evening tonight. And I really want to thank you for doing that. Yeah, thank you. So we have a little rule about questions. Because we don't have much time and because Tara is here and she's been so generous with sharing her life with us, I was hoping that you would be sensitive and ask questions that are interrogatives that end with a question mark. So, and if you would like to share with her separately, <laughs> perhaps you could be on the signing line and share with her separately. I'm sure she'd love to hear from you. But tonight, if you could please go to one of the two microphones in the aisles. Now the house lights are up. There are two microphones. If you would line up, please, and ask your questions. If they could be brief so that as many people could ask them, that would be terrific, thank you. Hi, how are you? Can you tell us your name? My name's Gretchen. Um, hello. Uh, I was wondering, because you bring up things you didn't know about, like the Holocaust and the civil rights movement. Is there a part of you who th that thinks um, there's some things you wish you didn't have to know about? Like kind of coming out to, to being in your own little cocoon, you know, for better or worse, but some things that are just like, gosh, I feel horrible knowing this and it was, nicer that I didn't know this. Yeah, I mean, I guess the Holocaust was like that. There was growing up in a world where that hasn't happened is kind of better than growing up in one where it has. But I think better is a tricky word in a way because um, it, I guess I, was, I never had to deal with a whole lot of cognitive dissonance about history or human nature or things like that. And I suppose that there was a, a pleasantness to that but I've never regretted knowing that. And I felt, I hate that word empowered because it's really overused, but I, I did feel made st stronger by it and more in possession of myself and my ideas for knowing it. And I, yeah, I, I don't really know anybody who given the chance to um, come out from under the kind of veils, bath sheet of ignorance would kind of want to go back in. I, I guess what I meant was like seeing the world in a more negative way since you know some of these horrible things. That's I guess what I was getting at. Yeah, there's negative and positive though. And I, 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 I was upset by the Holocaust for several, uh, that was a bad week, I think. <laughs> I, I would say it was not a good week. Um, 
But there were wonderful things I learned about too, and they were really uncomfortable. I remember the first time I thought maybe I wanted to go to law school, and I thought, well, women aren't allowed to do that, and that was very painful. I was suddenly, I was really excited about it. I was like, oh, it'll be fun. And then I was like, oh, I'm not supposed to do that. And I started fighting with myself, and it was really uncomfortable, but it was really exciting mm -hmm. because I uh, never thought that I could do those kinds of things, and they were the kinds of things I was drawn to. And so, yeah, I was more comfortable, but also the world was just getting bigger in all these ways. It was really exciting. It was, yes, there was war, and there was suffering, and there was all these things, but there was also, it was just such a bigger place, and there was more stuff for me to do in it than there had been before. Thank you. Hi, can you tell us your Hi, name? Hi, I'm Roxanne and um, loved your book, but I want to ask you something now beyond the book. Uh, you became a historian. I'd love to know why and what you are doing now as a historian. Um, I think I stuck with history because it was the first thing I, I studied that made me kind of aware of those different points of view, and for me that was just, it was powerful. I, I, I don't know why I was drawn to that, except I'm still drawn to it, and I can't quite puzzle it out. Well, how do we know the absolute truth if we allow these different perspectives? And that can be really destabilizing, but for me, it was, it was not destabilizing. I, I needed a, a way for my dad to believe his version in good faith, but maybe still be wrong. And history and studying all the different points of view kind of gave me a way of, of putting him in a context that I found really helpful. I'm not actually doing it using it now in any kind of active way. I've been on a, on a book tour for a while, and then now <laughs> there's not a lot of history involved in that. Um, and then I, I'm trying to do some writing right now that is contemporary. It's about the rural United States because there's just some storytelling I would like to do about the rural United States that is I haven't found as much being done. So that's kind of contemporary-ish, but um, maybe I hope one day to go back to history. Thank you. Hi. Hi, hi, I'm Nitty. Um, so I finished reading your book uh, Sunday, yesterday, uh, and I watched Knock Down the House as well, which was the Netflix documentary about the four women running for Congress. And it sort of left me um, just really lifted up in the sense of resilience. And you know, you talked about this as well. And so I'm curious, um, where, where is your resilience coming from? Where is that? And then on the flip side, I'm also curious, many of us who perhaps might have experienced something as you have um, with your family members and other experiences would feel very resentful and would feel incredibly angry and would carry that with us. Um, and so I'm curious, um, there's been a lot of conversation about the love that you've spoken about your family members with and the gratefulness that seems to be coming through with everything that you're talking about. So resilience on one side and then not being resentful or perhaps I'm interpreting that incorrectly, but how do you sort of reconcile those two and where are they coming from? I don't have a good answer on the resilience question and I get asked it a lot and I really should just make something up. Um, <laughs> but I got nothing. Uh, the other thing I got something, which the anger question I would say, there's time in my life that I, I've been very angry with my parents at various times in my life. I've been very angry with my parents at various times in the last week. But um, I think I came to some kind of conclusion about anger for, my own, for myself, which is just that I think anger has a role to play. I think it's a defense mechanism that your brain uses to get you out of situations that are probably bad for you. And you become angry and then you get out. For me, the problem with that is I just felt like the anger, it, it never stopped, and it kind of spread through my whole life. I became someone who had no beautiful memories. Every memory I had was just colored with this anger, and it's actually not very nice to be somebody that has no beautiful memories. It's, it's, you can't, I don't think, really function without some beauty in your life and in your past. And so what I found helpful to do was, um, separate myself enough from my parents that I didn't really need my anger so much. For me, I, I, if I had my parents in my life, I would need my anger. I would need it every day just to deal with it um, and not get sucked back into that cycle. But funny enough, now that I don't have them around me, I'm not in any danger. It's okay. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I can kind of put that somewhere and say, when I need that, I'm going to get it. But I'm actually okay right now. Like, I'm not in any danger. Nothing bad is happening to me, and I don't actually need to be that angry about this. And I can have a little space now to remember some of the good things. Thank you. Hi. 
Hey, yeah, uh, my name is Julian. Uh, finished your book like a week ago, so good timing. Um, I'm sorry if I'm breaking the rules. I'm, I'm going to try to turn into a pointed question. No, it actually has to be a question. Yeah, it, no, it is. There are other is. people but waiting. Like, I'm sorry. So you said like once the veil of ignorance removed, you don't want to go back, and it's, the change is likely for the better. So, you know, but until then, ignorant is like ignorance bliss. Until then, um, you know, I kind of felt like. Your parents, I don't want to call them like ignorant, but like they, they may have like denied the opportunity to kind of grow in some way. So it's like, why do you think like maybe your parents and other people in rural America as you're writing now are resisting the, the unveiling of whatever you want to call it? <laughs> uh, the political side of that is a much longer question than I'm, I'm not even going to touch the rural America side. Um, I would love to because I love talking about the rural US, but I don't think we have time. But the family side... Um, I, I think I had dissonance when I was growing up, but I wasn't as conscious of it. And then I became conscious of it, which in some ways was a lot more excruciating. What my parents' motives were, I don't really know. But I, t I say to people when they ask me what I think about homeschool, I say, I think education is about opening up uh, perspectives and being exposed to as many perspectives as you can. And if people who want to homeschool their kids, if they think they can, if they really think I can expose them to more points of view and more ideas, then I say go for it. Tyler homeschools his kids and it's great. My parents, I think, homeschooled us not because they wanted to expose us to more ideas, but because they wanted to not expose us to things they disagreed with. And my view of that is that that is less about education and more about control. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Linda. In reading your book, I found you to be such an unbelievably strong individual. And when you wrote your book, your characters, I mean, I have them clearly vivid in my mind. And my question is, why are there no pictures of your family? Because I'm just, I'm wondering if my vividness is, yeah. aligns with what they really look like. Uh, two reasons. I think, one, writing about people who are still alive is complicated, and I wanted to carve out as much space for them as I possibly could. I changed some of their names. I didn't give the name of the town. I was trying to carve out a space for them. Uh, the other reason, though, is more philosophical, which is I wanted the book... You know, if people were reading the book and I described my dad and they actually saw their dad or their aunt or their mother, I wanted them to do that. I don't know if any of you had this experience with Harry Potter. I read the Harry Potter books and then I saw the movies and now I can't read the books. It's like, it's all Daniel Radcliffe and Emma Watson. Like, that's the only thing I can see. And I didn't want the book... I think storytelling is meant to be about the universal things and people ought to see their own stories... And they, I'm happy with if I say my dad had, you know, dark hair and a mustache and your dad didn't. I think you can discard that and you just put it in your brain the way you want. But as soon as there's a picture, I think it becomes harder. And I, I didn't want it to be harder. I wanted it to be easier. Thank you. Hi. Hi, my name is Nora. Thank you so much for your book. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about gender and your experience with gender growing up and then in Brigham Young University, which was more conservative in terms of ideas for gender and later in life and now and maybe moments in your education that that changed how you think about your sister Audrey or yourself or your mother? Thank oh, you. easy question then. Um, <laughs> uh, complicated. My family had complicated ideas about gender and uh, that was one thing that I think I came to really late in life because I went so many wonderful things about BYU. I have so much respect for BYU. But like, feminism is not... You don't go to BYU if you want to hear a defense of feminism. That's not where you go. And uh, at least I've heard it's getting much better, actually. But when I was there, I had a classmate once who, in all seriousness, uh, I said to him, do you think women can be ambitious? And he said, oh, absolutely, of course. Of course women can be ambitious, but their ambition is for children. <laughs> um, and I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and... <laughs> I, you know, I didn't hear a serious defense of feminism until I was at Cambridge, and um, it took me a while to come around to it. So I, I don't. I, I would just say I was slow on that front, and I I still haven't combed through it as much as I would like. But I would say, what I have read about feminism, which is a lot more than I I had even five years ago, I've never found anything that spoke to me more than the thing that I found my first semester at BYU at Cambridge. Sorry, which was John Stuart Mill just saying. Um, 
that argument where he said, we don't actually know what women are, what they're capable of, because we've distorted them, put all this weird pressure on them, and defined them to themselves, and we've basically just screwed it up. So he says that beautiful line, of the nature of women, nothing final can be known. And I've never found anything that I've read, and I've read some wonderful things that spoke to me more than that that just said, I don't have any idea what you are, <laughs> I don't have any idea what you're capable of, and you should go work that out uh, yourself. And um, I, I, I don't know, I, I still love that idea. It's just, for me, really, only time I've ever been so comforted by just a complete absence of knowledge. Hi. Hi, so um, I'm actually here with my school, I'm Mama Cullen Bryant high school in Queens, and you guys talked before about how you wouldn't tell students about the possibility that education can change their perspective and eventually their character in life. So what would you say to young students here today going forth with that ideal? So t going forth with the idea that education can change their yeah. perspective? Their perspective and their character. Yeah, I would say, I mean, sometimes we talk about education in this kind of dead way that it's all about getting a degree so you can get a job and get a mortgage and move to a better school district so your kids can go to better schools so they can get a better mortgage and a better job <laughs> and a better school district so their kids can, and it's all very um, bureaucratic. And I would say, yeah, education should be, um, it should change powerful, important, intimate things. And that was what I had to figure out when I was writing my book, is that the story of my family and the story of my education were the same thing. Because when I got my education, I became technically, I suppose, more employable, although that was never tested. Um, <laughs> theoretically, I could get a job. And um, all those things would have been great. It would be so nice, I guess, to go be a consultant. But really what changed is that I uh, looked at my life in a different way and made different decisions than I would have made if I hadn't had that. And it was my, my personal life, not necessarily my career, that was so impacted. Hi. Hi. I loved your book. So uh, my question to you would be, what was the most motivating factor for you while you were studying? Um, because there are always so many reasons to quit, but very few to continue. <laughs> That's true. Um, I think I didn't want to work in my dad's junkyard at all, actually. And I don't think I understood when I went to college that you graduated at the end. I, I'm not joking. I don't think I really understood that. I think I was well into my second year when someone I met someone who's in their fourth year and they were leaving. And I was like, wait, we have to leave at some point? Like, that's a thing? And I was suddenly very terrified. So I don't think I really understood it. As it's, I just thought you kind of went for a while. I don't know. Um, so I wasn't working towards a degree because I didn't really know that was a thing. I just didn't want to go back. I didn't want to work my dad's junkyard. Uh, that's not very helpful. I don't know if most people can really harness that. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I wish I had a better answer for you. It's, it's the truth, though. Hi. Hi, my name is Elaine. Um, so my question is, um, growing up while this is happening to you, did you ever come to think that this would be something you could potentially write about or talk about? No. Uh, I thought God wrote books. I didn't think people wrote books. Um, God or like evil people, like either God or the devil wrote the books. Like that was my kind of paradigm. So no, I think even when my supervisor told me I should write it, it, it didn't feel possible or real. I'd never read any contemporary books. I'd only read a couple classics and um, no, it didn't, it didn't, it still doesn't really feel, it still feels very odd that we're sitting here talking about me. Uh, it's, yeah, if I ever get my head around that, I'll let you know, but it hasn't happened yet. Hi, uh, my name is Manuel, and um, I really enjoyed uh, the segment of your, uh, uh, the segment where you talked about perspective and including that in your novel. And what I wanted to ask you is, how do you balance including such a broad range of perspectives while still telling your authentic story? Um, it's funny. I put the perspectives in the footnotes for the most part because I, I think that I was trying to represent. I wrote some scenes, so they just represented everybody's feedback, and I did that. And then uh, I found that impossible to do for some scenes because if, if you wrote it that way so that everyone was represented, like, 
which was impossible because we disagreed too much. So then maybe it's just the historian in me. I thought, well, that is a footnote. <laughs> That's what that is. That's a mess. And um, I think that that was, that was an easy way for me to do it. I had enough trouble with perspective with the main body of the text trying to balance the adult writing it with the kid who is experiencing it and trying to navigate that tension was was about all I could manage. And then for other perspectives, I, 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 I used footnotes. And for me, that was, I think it's just my training, maybe. Thank you. Hi, I'm Susan. Uh, I have a question about, uh, I was also estranged from my parents. And uh, the woman who asked about the pictures reminded me that as soon as my friend and I read your book, we looked up your mother's business. And have you heard anything about whether you've had an impact on that? I haven't. I don't think so from, uh, I guess I've heard a little bit, but I don't think so. I kind of went out of my way to not identify it. So I don't, I don't think so, but I, I could be wrong about that. Thank you. Hi, thank you for a wonderfully beautifully messy story about estrangement and connection. Um, it was really a, a tremendous read, and so thank you. Uh, throughout the story, I'm, I'm, I kept being curious about your connection to place. Uh, so we talk about these connections to family, but th kind of three institutions figure prominently in the book. And were you able to kind of dissociate what's happening in your, in your life, your personal transformation, with what you're learning in the classroom? You know, what's your feeling now on your experience at BYU, at Cambridge, at Harvard? I think they all kind of bl blend together. I think I was, I changed a lot when I was in college. And then a, a funny thing would happen where I would go home and I would just immediately cross over my dad's <laughs> doorstep and turn into an older version of myself. And that happened for a really long time. I think it, it was a different kind of strength that I hadn't, it took a while for me to build up to kind of hold on to this newer version I was trying to grow even when I was in old circumstances. We're being told we've got to hurry. One more question. All right, Thank nobody you. else is allowed to get up. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That was the last question. I'm, I'm sorry. This question better be good. Um, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> right. My name is Swetha, and like most of us here, I really did enjoy your book. I was particularly fascinated by your family's distrust in medicine and modern medicine and doctors. And again, disclosure, I'm a physician. I think that's what I was really enamored with um, to the point where I was almost angry when your mother's salve worked um, because <laughs> it was just one of those like, oh my God, it, it happened. But I'm curious to hear your opinion on the anti-vaxxer movement because I think that's something that's also based in distrust of the medical establishment and then also what your opinion would be on how to perhaps increase the trust of those who are distrustful. Um, I'm gonna do the first part of that and I hope, I don't know if I have something for the second, but I'll do my best. Um, I think the hard thing about my dad's views are that he's not, he's not utterly wrong. It's not like the healthcare system and the pharmaceutical industry are like great. Um, and as the more that we learn about the opioid and like what they were doing, it's just like conspiracy starts to seem <laughs> not crazy. Um, but I think the, the, the problem, I guess, is the one you, you, for my parents, I think they had a lot of things that would work really well that I can't really explain. Part of the herbs, they could do things. My perspective on what the trouble is that they didn't know what their limits were and they couldn't respect the times where something was a little bit out of their hands and they needed to bring in modern medicine and, um, I think that has to do maybe with a kind of grandiosity narrative about like where their own where their own skills come in. But I mean, I, I, I do think it's 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 just it is incredibly complicated because of the fact that the institutions that they're so paranoid of are incredibly screwed up. They're just not screwed up in the way they think they are. And um, I guess one way to try to tackle it is, is to try to just make them better. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think if our healthcare system, maybe if we didn't have doctors taking money to poison their patients, some of these rumors wouldn't um, persist. And there might be just a more general trust there. 
it kind of makes me think, because I do think that my parents, they're not, they're not wrong that the, that the institution has serious problems, they're just wrong about what those problems are. That's a bummer to end on, but. <laughs> Healthcare. <laughs> Have a good night. <laughs>